Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Here we go, everybody. Bob Lust coming at you live. I see Nick Kajuski sticking up right there, showing up. Glad to see you, man. Hey, uh, got a pretty good show lined up, I think. And we're going to know here in a minute. See Howard Dittrich checking in. I bet you he's hanging out in Florida. James Allen. I see James here. Um, I thought about it today, and I thought, what, what kind of a topic would be a good one to talk about? And I, I see, uh, look at there. There's Tim Stewart. He got to... Time to join Zoom. Really, I don't know how to, I mean, I've, I've done Zoom, but I don't know how to do it with this, and how do you record it, and then what do you do with it, and how much work it is. Justin Ludwig, good to see you. Good to see you, folks. Ryan Triple, good to see you. We got, looks like 19 people on board, 18 people, something like that. Troy Todd, good to see Troy. You guys know the drill. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comment section. Click like, or the little heart, whatever that is, emoji, whatever that thing is down there, and share this to your timeline, and you're eligible for drawing for a Palm Boss hat and a Palm Boss t-shirt. We have a winner this week. Leanne sent me the name. It's uh, Tom Blasdell. So, Tom, if you're watching, check in and uh, let us know your shirt size. Send us an email. I see John Funk. Holy cow, we got a lot of, a lot of folks checking in now. So let me do a little rearranging here so I can see this better. I got my computer on level ground. Michael Eric, Michael, good to hear from you, buddy. Let's see here. Drew Bachman checking in. Tim Stewart has got first to five, so he got a bass, five pounds. I think there's a contest going on with those guys. So let's see, we got Florida. We got two from Florida. Tim and Howard are from Florida. Troy Todd, Michael Eric, Iowa. Justin, Billy Banks from Maryland, John Funk, Michigan, Kim Moore from Illinois, Mike Cottrell from Palo Pena County, Texas. Had some pretty funky weather blow your way. I drove right in front of that the other day. Look at there, Tim and Danny Mack are already talking about stuff. Super. Drew Bachman is from uh, North Carolina. Blair, Blair Ulring, good to see Blair, Todd Austin. All right, you guys know how this goes. So I thought tonight I would talk about a couple of topics. I've had this conversation. There's Travis Smith checking in. Um, 28 inch, 14 pound John Funk catfish. He got some big catfish going on. So I'm going to try to keep up with your questions a little faster tonight. But what I thought I'd talk about tonight is how do fish get in my pond if I don't stock it? Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't know, but I'll tell you this, I, I don't really buy into the birds moving fish. And you know what? I I'll be the first one to tell you, I have watched <laughs> Josie just texted me. <laughs> so uh, I know Josie's got to be watching. She and Wayne, this is their date night, so I'm glad y'all are there. Michael Gray checking in. Let's see here. Troy Seal. Good to see Troy. Yep. All right. I'm looking on my phone here so I can not miss anything because uh, my phone and my computer are not the same. I see things on my phone I don't see on, on my computer and vice versa. So um, I, I have watched... Uh, when we were at LL, comma two, I watched great blue herons more than once catch a bluegill, big bluegill, fly off with it, and then drop it. Well, if it does that, and it drops it over water in a brand new pond, then I could see how that fish could make it, even though it might fall 100 feet from the sky and land in the water. You know, but I've, I've seen more fish fall flop out of the mouth of a great blue heron that ends up on the ground than in a pond. You know, so here's the here's the way I see like birds' eggs or, or, or fish eggs on birds' legs, stuff like that. I, I just I just can't buy into that because a, a fish egg is a living, breathing little entity, its own. When I say breathing, it's it is it's literally breathing. It gets oxygen from the water. So if 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 an egg sticks to the leg of a, of a wading bird, then the wading bird flies and the egg comes off. It's got to go onto a hard substrate and then hatch without getting eaten by an insect or another fish, you know, or a frog or whatever. So the odds are astronomical against an egg coming off of a leg of a bird and establishing a population of fish in a pond. Now, I could see how a few individuals could, but you... 
If you also think about those eggs, when that bird takes off and that egg is stuck to it, or those eggs or whatever it is, and that bird flies a quarter of a mile, those eggs are going to dry out. And when they dry out, they die. So there's all the stars have to line up perfectly, in my mind, for birds to transport eggs on their legs. Now, there's been one study done in Europe where in a lab they fed some some viable fertile egg, carp eggs, to a bird. The bird pooped them out, and a tiny fraction of those eggs actually hatched. I think most of those eggs are going to get digested and turn into bird. You know, so that does still doesn't answer the question, how do fish get from your pond to my pond? And I, I cannot argue this point with anybody because everybody's going to say, well, it happened to me where I had a pond in the very top of the watershed. There's no pond above it at all. And I got fish in it. So they didn't come from upstream, coming downstream. Well, I'm going to tell you, I can't tell you how many times after a major rain, especially in my 20s, 30s, and 40s, I would drive to some pond play, some pond sites that I knew had new ponds, and I would walk out on those pastures and water three to five inches deep looking for fish. And it was not usual that I saw very many, but it was common that after that water settled down, that I would find little baby bluegills or little baby bass lying in the weeds or in a cattle hoof print, or in a little puddle somewhere between ponds, where they were swimming from downstream upstream. You know, when, when there's a pond that's in fairly close proximity to a river, maybe it's uh, the pond feeds into a small tributary that feeds into a creek, that feeds into a bigger creek, that feeds into the river. It's really common for little bitty carp at the right time of the year to swim up, go up those little, oh, they don't need two inches of water and they'll swim and they'll go. And that's how I believe that fish get from one pond to the next. And, and I had a little debate with a guy a couple of days ago. He says, well, there's no way that could happen in my place. Okay, well, you still got carp in your pond. <laughs> we don't know how. And he said it happened during a drought. So if it happened during a drought, now, to me, that means there's human intervention. Well, who's going to put carp in a pond? Unless it's somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. You know, so, so here's my point. When somebody builds a brand new pond, it's not unusual for them to be told, well, you need to wait a year before you put any fish. I don't believe that. I believe as soon as that, I believe when you build a brand new pond or a brand new lake or you clean one out or, or, or one goes dry during a drought, when that thing fills back up with water and you're confident that it's going to hold water, you don't have any issues with seepage, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'd stock fish in it because you want to overwhelm that pond with your fish. Like where Tim Stewart lives down in South uh, Florida, he deals with walking catfish, plecostomus, he deals with armored catfish, he deals with eels, he deals with apple snails, they're about as big around as your, you know, that. So he's got all kinds of little invasive things that show up in his pond. He even drained his pond and killed everything in it, but there were just enough armored catfish hunkered six inches in the mud that when it filled back up, here they go, you know, so... I'm a, I'm a big proponent of going ahead and stocking a pond as soon as it's got enough water in it. Now, here's what that means to me. What I tell people is I want to see at least half the surface acreage covered in water, at least eight feet deep in the deepest part, going into a rainy season. And then I'm totally comfortable stocking bass, or not bass, but fathead minnows, bluegill, red ear sunfish, or up north it'd be fathead minnows with some... Uh, pumpkin seeds, and maybe even a few yellow perch when it's when the time is right. I'm totally cool with doing that. So uh, uh, how they get from pond to pond is subject to debate. I believe they swim there. That's what I believe. I've seen, uh, I've seen several ponds. I came across a pond several years ago. Uh, this uh, fellow out of Austin built two ponds, one, one above another one on his property, which is directly across the street from a well-managed pond across the highway outside of Bastrop, Texas. And he didn't do anything with it. So uh, he built the pond. Seven years later, he calls me and says, hey, I think I'm ready to put some fish in these two ponds. Well, I happened to be going to that neck of the woods, so I popped in and looked, and I saw all kinds of little bitty bait fish. I saw little baby bluegills. I saw little bitty baby bass. This was in April of the year, swimming all around the edges. And I said, hey, you know, 
I, I can't comfortably sell you four or $5,000 worth of fish. I think we need to bring the electric fishing boat down here and let's just see what you got. Because this pond's been here seven years. So I took the electric fishing boat down there and put it in and that lake was as close to balance as it could get. It was leaning heavy on overcrowded with bass. But what had happened was there'd been a couple of floods five years earlier and young of the year fish washed down into both his ponds and stocked it for him. It's the only time in 42 years I've ever seen a lake end up being stocked by the watershed where it was worth it and it was good. So he didn't need to buy any fish. It was time for him to start catching some fish. So let's see here. I'm going to back up here. Steve Lewis, happy belated birthday. Thanks, man. 67 never felt better. Um, Howard says, a quarter acre pond. What do you use after you've treated the surface algae with diquat, but now there's slime everywhere? Can't pull a beetle spin through the water. Copper nicks. Um, you know, if, if, if there's slime everywhere, if it's floating on top of the water and it's a variety of colors, it's dead. Now, if it's that bright green algae and it's growing, looks like angel hair maybe, or little puff balls under the water, then you do need to treat it again. And, and the go-to is copper-based algae sides for that. Dave Weber, I got a great, now if it, if it is, I'll tell you this, this is something Howard would actually do. Uh, one thing I've done in the past for somebody, if, if we've gone and treated algae and it died and floated to the top, and we knew it would be a couple of three weeks before it needed to be treated again, because when you use herbicides, pardon me, then what you end up with is you're mowing the grass, basically. Because it takes three things for plants to grow. You gotta have the right temperature, which most of us have right now, takes food, which is in the mud, and it takes sunlight. So if you take away any of those three, then that plant's not gonna grow. And every plant's got its own window of temperature growth. So it's just gonna start growing at different temperatures. You know, and so uh, in that case, it's your, when you treat it with a herbicide, it's a contact herbicide that's gonna knock it out, but then something else is gonna come back if those three circumstances exist. So what we would do is to um, get a pump and I had, a, I had a Honda pump back when I did this. I don't do this anymore because it's not fun. But with that Honda pump, I bought a fireman's nozzle and I put on the outtake side, put a screen on the input side and set that little Honda pump on the shore. And you could actually spray those mats of algae, break them up and they, they break down a lot quicker. All right, let's see here. Dave Weber, I got a great nugget out of the Artificial Habitat article in this issue of the magazine. Really enjoy all of yours and all the different authors articles. Thank you very much, David Weber from uh, Northwestern Missouri, Northeast of Kansas City. Howard says, if you build, oh, tonight I'm drinking water because Debbie brought it to me. <laughs> Yeehaw. So Howard says, if you build artificial trees out of PVC, et cetera, do you have to rough up the surface, surface to facilitate the attachment of right stuff? That's smart to do. If you just take a real rough piece of sandpaper, just, just run it up and down it two or three times, rough it up, then that gives it better adhesion points for periphyton to grow or microscopic colonies of algae. And it, it does work better if you rough it up because you know some of that those bacterial colonies and the periphyton colonies things, when they try to attach it and it's smooth, just a little bit of wave action will knock it off and disrupt all that. So let's see here. I think Matt Marsden rubs his up. Matt Marsden with American Fish Trees on here, watching what we're doing here. Billy Bates, Bob, why do even my biggest bluegill gobble up the Aquamax 400 but spit out the 500? Nine times out of 10, they prefer the tiny pellets over the bigger pellets. I observe this over and over again. I do not know the answer to that because the only difference between 400 and 500 is the pellet size. So I could see how small bluegills would have a hard time swallowing a bigger pellet. I can see that, you know, so I don't have a good answer for that, but because I don't think that happens everywhere. So uh, I would just about, I would almost bet it's because the size of the bluegill that are, that are eating it. That would, that'd be what my best guess would be. Now, here's the caveat to that. Bluegill don't all grow at the same rates. So there should be some bluegill big enough that they would eat that 500. The only thing I can possibly think of is, is sometimes, and I hate this, but this happens, sometimes dealers will buy a, a fish food product 
and not sell it, keep it in the warehouse, then it dries out, it loses all of its moisture content, which it doesn't have much to begin with, but when it gets really dry, it gets brittle. And if they sit on it for seven or eight or nine months and gives it some age, you know, and then sell it in the springtime, it's not fresh. And that, that, could, that could play a role. And it's not so much that the fat in it gets rancid because it's, it's, it's coated with a little bit layer of, of uh, fish oil, you know, of the omegas. So I don't have a good answer for that other than I would just about bet the ones that are spitting it out are a different size than the ones that aren't. Travis said, I asked you last year, a neighbor here built, built a quarter acre pond. I watched them build the pond. The pond filled up. He stocked fatted minnows and bluegills in March and bass in June. Last year, he was fishing last October and caught eight bass or eight catfish. He was shocked. He did not put the catfish in there. And there's no ponds close by. Yep. Well, yep. Well, I'll tell you this. If a fish hatchery includes catfish in a bag of minnows or a bag of bluegill, they won't stay in business very long. The reputable hatcheries don't do that. Now, I tell you what I have seen from just rare occasion is at a fish hatchery, they have all these concrete tanks, right? And that's where they store their fish. They bring them up from the ponds. They put them in these concrete troughs, long uh, rectangular troughs with aeration and well water typically. They fill them with pond water then convert it to well water to flush the pond water out, let the fish clean out, and then they'll load those fish and transport them to the dealer or to a pond or wherever they're going. On a rare occasion, there can be a few fish left behind. Now, I would also bet you that in this pond that you're talking about here, Travis, look at those catfish and see if they're bullheads. If they're bullheads, they came in in that watershed. Okay, Adam Clemens says, uh, talk to us about aluminum sulfate for phosphate mitigation. All right, so what what he's wanting to know there, Harrison Davis, good to see you, buddy. Matt Marsden is waving at us. All right, so Adam, aluminum sulfate, here's what it does. It, when, you, when you apply it properly, when the aluminum phosphate, I mean aluminum sulfate hits the water, there's a chemical reaction that causes the aluminum, aluminum and phosphate to separate, then the aluminum grabs, <laughs> the aluminum sulfate breaks apart the molecule. Then the aluminum grabs the phosphorus, causes it to flocculate or make bigger parcels. Then it settles out, sequesters it into the bottom. Now you gotta be smart about that because when you're, when you're, when you're adding aluminum sulfate to a pond, when that chemical reaction occurs, and it's, it's, I tell you what it's like, it's like a positive and negative magnet that attracts. So the aluminum's positive, the phosphate's negative, uh, the sulfate's negative. So the sulfate releases, and the aluminum grabs that uh, phosphate, and then it causes those little clumps to form, and then it settles out and it lays on the bottom, so it flocculates out. But when that happens, and that sulfur is left in the water, and it can't connect to something, you can only get to a certain point where your pH is gonna plummet. So you've gotta be really, really careful. Ask me how I know that. Or you're gonna kill fish. So if you do it, you need to do some really um, explicit calculations. You need to know water volume. You need to understand the water chemistry. You need to know how much phosphorus you're trying to sequester. Here's another thing about trying to sequester phosphate. It's the phosphate's got to be free dissolved into the water or you're not going to do it. If it's, if it's bound in blue-green algae or if it's bound in any kind of living plant, the aluminum sulfate's not going to sequester it. So there you go. Now I am going to talk about sunfish here in just a minute. Travis is still waiting on his magazine. I have no idea what that is. Send an email to info at palmboss.com. I tell you, we have this year since probably since... September of 2021 up until now the post office is not delivering everybody's magazines and it's irritating as hell because I spend two dollars and 25 cents with the printer and the layout guy and postage to get those magazines printed up and gone to the post office you know and so actually it costs more than that that doesn't even count the postage that just counts the printing and the layout you know so then we got to turn around and send another one out first class and then pretty soon we're losing money, but it's more important to me to get for you to get that magazine. 
Okay, uh, and just send Travis, send an info at palmmoss.com and uh, Leanne and I will get it. Leanne will send out magazines straight ahead. Okay, there's Danny Mac talking about his fish. All right, let's see. Howard, that's enough questions. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Billy Bates. These are 11 inch bluegill, your biggest. Oh my gosh, I'd be switching those to 600. See if the Elite 600 or even try the MVP. I've not seen fish want to spit out MVP. Okay, Danny Mack working on taxes and he's passed out. I hear that. Hey, Dave Hamilton, good to see you, brother. Good to, good to talk to you. I think you just heard the spiel about uh, aluminum sulfate. Mike Cook from Charlotte. Travis wants an update. Oh, the books have been shipped. The printer called today. Our books have been shipped. We should have them within five or six days and they're ready to go. And uh, I haven't seen haven't seen the book yet. I know what it's supposed to look like, but I haven't seen it. So we'll see. Adam is asking, and there's Doug Cusick. Good to see Doug. Uh, Doug. Adam, can you buffer your application? Yes, you can. You know, but at the same time as you buffer it, you've got to be careful that you're not detracting from the alkalinity, for example. You don't want to buffer it without understanding how you're going to affect the other consequences in the chemistry of the water and how that affects the biology of the water. So yeah, you need to do a little homework on that before you do it. Jacob, good to see you brother. Jacob West checking in. Michael Eric's not gotten his yet either. Yep, yeah, well send us another, send us an email. I don't know, I mean, we do our part, I promise you. We get that those magazines out. Now I was late with the March-April issue, that was my fault because I just didn't get it done. I had too much on my plate and I just didn't get it done. Dave Weber is also skeptical about the fish eggs on duck's feet because all my local coffee shop experts say that everybody knows that all our Kansas spawns get stocked by Oklahoma tornadoes. <laughs> you know what? Okay. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, Harrison says, I was listening to one of your videos from last year. Must say you don't mess around with smoke and fire. Uh, you know, I really don't. I'm not much on smoke and fire. Smoking mirrors either. Okay, let's talk about sunfish. Uh, one of the interesting things to me, I, I tell you what, I'm going to tell you a little backstory. Back in the 80s, when I was really figuring out where I belong in this fish world, hey Chuck, good to see you, man. Um, we need to have a conversation, I think. You sent me a text or an email or something. I was tied up all day today with grandkids, and it's kind of hard to, when you're, when you're taking care of two toddlers, it's really hard to be doing the things that you know you need to do when you're doing things that you should do. You know, so take that for what it's worth. Pure water, boys, girls. Um, and I maybe I answered yours. I don't remember. I get a lot. Okay, Danny Mac has used Fosclear. That's a good one to look at. Look at Fosclear or Foslock. Look those two up and see. Um, check it out. Yep, and what Danny Mac is saying is, is appropriate for what we're talking about here. Okay, now I'm talking about sunfish. Back in the day when I was roaming the highways, you know, this I'm going to offer up a confession. I wasn't comfortable driving down the highway aimlessly. Even though I knew I was going to be going from point A to point B to do something, I might have a two and a half hour or three hour drive, and I didn't like being unoccupied. So what I did was I started forcing my brain, I would hold my brain captive. Instead of my brain saying, hey, you know, oh, look at that billboard. Dad, I don't like that billboard. But wait a minute, it says there's a there's an awesomes down the road. Man, I love awesomes burritos, but you know, those burritos, golly, you don't need to eat them. And, and then, uh, but you know, there's a Whataburger right up here. You know, all, all that random stuff, I just didn't like that. So I didn't do that much. I would try to do the best I could to hold my brain captive. And one of the things I would do with my brain is I learned every single major highway going through Texas. I learned as many counties, county seats. I learned how to do math, figuring out how many gallons of water per unit and, you know, acre feet. And, and then as I was doing all that, one of the things that I thought about was I need to learn about all these fish. Because back then, you know, before Al Gore invented the internet, you know, before there were mobile phones, you know, the only thing you could do is learn by reading a book or talking to somebody that's been there, done that, or go do it yourself, and it, and it hits you in the back pocket every time you screwed up. So 
I started learning about the different species of fish. Well, I knew that when we were going to be stocking ponds, the four big ones were going to be fathead minnows, bluegills, red ear sunfish, or channel catfish, and bass. And then add that later, add in red ear sunfish, and then golden shiners, and threadfin sheds. So I decided, you know, I really needed to learn about all these different fish. Well, you know, as you're doing what I did, you're, you're, you're in water all the time, and you're always seeing something cool. You know, so there'd be times I'd take the electric fishing boat, and I'd shock up one warmouth, 200 bluegill, a couple of red ear, a green sunfish, and some sunfish. I didn't know what they were. So over, those, over that course of time, I've looked at orange spotted sunfish, dollar sunfish. I've looked at long ears, red breast. Bluegill, red ear, matter of fact, three or four strains of bluegill. I've looked at green sunfish, hybrid sunfish. Um, I don't know if I mentioned long ears, I think I did. Uh, Warmouth, you know, and the things I started seeing about these sunfish is even though some of them, pumpkin seeds, even though some of them look the same, like a pumpkin seed looks kind of like a red ear, but they're totally different. Pumpkin seeds live in the northern tier of states, red ear live in the southern tier. They make a living similarly, but they don't reproduce the same, although they reproduce close to the same. <laughs> so what I started figuring out, learning, was all these different sunfish live in different niches in the pond. Now, they might live in the same zone, like the littoral zone, but a green sunfish is going to spawn at a different time than a bluegill does, which spawns at a different time than the red ear do. So the main point I want to make tonight is that all these different sunfish, even though you look at them and some of them look similar, like a long ear looks kind of like a bluegill, except it doesn't have the blue patch on its gill. You know, so when you start looking at these fish side by side, they may look similar, <coughs> but they're not. They're, they're completely different. Uh, uh, the biggest long ear I've ever seen was probably five inches long. The biggest bluegill I've seen held in my hands is over three pounds. You know, bluegill in southern states, they're going to spawn three to five times. In the Midwest, two to three times. In northern states, one to two times. Because of the temperature, their growing season is shorter in northern tier states. So, you know, we look at bluegill as the backbone of the food chain for bass lakes in the south. But bluegill, not going to play that same role in northern ponds because they don't reproduce enough and when they don't reproduce enough, they grow so fast, they can outgrow the, the typical size of a largemouth bass in northern states. You know, so understanding all these sunfish, and include largemouth bass. Largemouth bass are sunfish. Not a lot of folks know that. Um, you guys probably do because you, you're interested in this stuff. But um, crappie are sunfish. And so when you start looking at all these different fish, the first thing I'm going to tell you is look at their mouth size. The bigger their mouth is, the more predatory they are. A green sunfish's mouth is about that big of a, of a fish that's maybe five or six inches long compared to a bluegill's mouth that you can't get a number two pencil in its mouth. You know, so the size of the mouth also is going to tell you the role that it can play in your fishery. You know, a, a green sunfish, I think, get a pretty bad rap because people think they're trash fish. Well, they exist. You know, do they interfere? Will they eat baby bluegills? You bet they will. So they're going to compete with a bass of a similar mouth size. Warmouth got a, even a bigger mouth than a green sunfish. The biggest warmouth I've ever seen is probably eight inches long. And they don't reproduce well in ponds. They're more of a creek type or a river, slow moving river type sunfish. That's where they'd rather be. <coughs> Red breast sunfish, beautiful. Probably one of the prettiest sunfish other than copper nose bluegill out there. And they make a nest bigger than a bass does. I've seen some 26 to 28 inch diameter nests that red breast makes. And they're so aggressive running around in it defending that nest. You know, so all these different sunfish, green sunfish, they're native at almost every watershed in the United States. So don't be surprised if you build a brand new pond, if you didn't take out some of the puddles in the creek don't be surprised if you wind up with a few green sunfish. And if you do, it's not the end of the world. They reproduce once a year. You know, so once the bass get established, even though the green sunfish are, have a bigger mouth and they're a little bit more aggressive than their other than their cousins, you know, simply because the bluegill cannot reproduce them and the bass cannot overeat them, 
uh, green sunfish numbers will typically drop by about year three or four or five. There's been a very, very few occasions where I've suggested that people eradicate green sunfish to start a pond over. Usually I say, you know what, there's a missing size class of bass that can control those numbers. Because if the green sunfish got out of hand, it's because they swam from a pond downstream before the pond got stocked. So that's, that's about all I got to say about that. So I did want to talk a little bit about the different species of sunfish. And what I think is real important for you guys to know is to uh, understand when, when you catch one you don't know, uh, shoot a picture of it. Look it up. Learn about that fish because not all sunfish are bad sunfish. Some of them are great. Okay, let's see here. I see uh, Scott and Leah is checking in. James Allen is the latest magazine, January, February. You know, the latest one is March, April. We mailed it like March the 15th. Started hitting mailboxes around March the 20th. You know, and, and it's I can, I can see how some of the March, April may still be in the mainstream or the mail stream, even though this is April the 6th. Now, I'm almost finished with the May-June. Matter of fact, I'm hoping to get that to lay out by, uh, by Monday of this next week, and that's going to give me enough time to get it laid out, get it to the printer, and get that one mailed out by about the 20th of April. Scott and Leah listening in. Good to see you folks. I noticed, Troy says, I noticed that ponds in Maryland, Pennsylvania that aren't even managed far surpass ponds in East Tennessee that aren't managed. What's the water or soil up there that grows panfish so well? Well, first of all, Water and ponds in Maryland and Pennsylvania are influenced by temperature totally differently than eastern Kentucky. I mean, uh, eastern Tennessee. Eastern Tennessee, you've got some pretty dramatic rises and falls in temperature, you know, and that can totally influence the way fish grow. Where along the Atlantic seaboard, maybe as far in as, as uh, Pennsylvania, your, your water temperature is mitigated some. Now, I know you get ice cover, I get that, but you know, you've got some pretty rich, fertile farmlands over there. And I would just about bet it would have to be something to do with minerals that are dissolved into the water, either from the watershed or from groundwater, wherever the water comes from, and that there's some nutrition there that's uh, not there in eastern Tennessee where the soils are pretty rocky. All right, let's see here. Robbie, what's the best way to prevent runoff into a pond? Sediment pond is not an option due to a neighbor. Best way to prevent runoff. When you say runoff, I'm going to presume you're talking about silt or dirt, Robbie. You know, when the word when I hear the word runoff, to me that means water coming downhill after it hits the ground from rain. That's what runoff is to me. But if you're talking about sediment, uh, sediment pond is not an option because due to the neighbor. If sediment's coming from a neighbor, the neighbor needs to stop it. It's up to the neighbor to stop that. And I would litigate that, and I would do it. I would do it in a friendly way. Say, "Hey, dude, your your dirt showing up in my pond. Can you come and get it? You know, or let's prevent it. Set up some silt fences." Now, the problem with silt fences, it's they can only hold so much, you know. And then when they clog up with silt, you got to go clean them out. So when the silt, the, what the silt fence is designed to do is to keep dirt from moving in where the dirt's been disturbed. But when you start talking about the volumes of water that flow after a rainfall event coming into your pond, there are not many silt fences around that can really hold that. So uh, I think I'd talk to the neighbor. If it's not an option because of the neighbor, that's telling me the problem is because of the neighbor. I would visit with the neighbor and see. See if they like a, a ham for Christmas or something. <laughs> Take a peace offering and love on them a little bit and see what they say. Okay, um, let's see, 704. You know what? Hey, I haven't talked about Palm Balls Magazine. Palm Balls Magazine, right here. Right here, 35 bucks a year. Dave Weber got some nuggets out of this latest one from Habitat. And oh, by the way, Chico and I just finished a, the, probably the best video that we've ever done that's going to be at, it's about fish habitat. And here in another couple of weeks, it'll be uploaded to the Institute of Higher Pondology. Now, I'm telling you, there's some premier... Um, knowledge and information on that Institute of Higher Pondology. Yes, I'm going to sell it because I'm, it's going to save you the dumb tax. That's what I tell people. And I totally believe that. I believe it will help you save the dumb tax. And when we post up this video on Habitat, Debbie watched it today for the first time. And she's highly critical about stuff that I do sometimes. 
And she looked at that. She said, this is the best video you've ever done. It's like 27 minutes long. We go visit five different places, five different lake sites where guys are building new lakes. And it, it, I have to tell you, it really is good because three of those guys did exactly what we told them to do. Another one was kind of there and another one didn't do a thing we told them to do. So it, not only does it tell you what you, what you should do and you shouldn't do, it, it, it shows you, you know, the upsides and downsides. So it's, that's a good, it's a good video. Institute of Higher Pond Technology, pondboss.teachable.com. Pond Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year. Uh, cheaper than a Friday night date. Debbie and I are going to go to dinner after this. And I guarantee I'm going to spend more than 35 bucks on that dinner when we go out. So, um, also like to thank our sponsors, Purina Mills. I've worked with them a long time. You know, uh, I think they have some of the best products out there. I, I know that, that there's times people get frustrated with their distribution system. Like a while ago when I was talking about some of the feed, sometimes the dealers don't do what the manufacturer says. The dealers, they sell a variety of different brands of products. You know, and so you kind of take that fish to the water, but you can't make it eat. You know, that's kind of the way it works sometimes with the dealers. So sometimes it's up to us to educate the dealers on what we want and make sure that the, the fish food's fresh, for example. But I love Purina Mills. Their ears are always open and their heart's in the right spot and their research and development is right on. And I, I'm, I'm a big fan and I have been for a long time because I've been around them a long time. Uh, Texas Hunter Feeders, Chris Blood, and that team there, uh, Dale Baden, president of Texas Hunter Feeders, great people, great products, great people, great customer service. Uh, Easy Docs of Texas, David Schneider, but I haven't seen him on here tonight. He usually is, but I haven't seen him. But, uh, he's a sponsor as well. And I totally believe in these folks. And I'll tell you what, when we, when we put advertisements in Pond Boss Magazine, I vet them. I don't take an ad from somebody I don't believe in. And I have conversations with them. I want to know how they think and, and how they do business. And there's been more than once, more than once I have rejected ads because they didn't make sense to me. And, it, it, and I, didn't, I didn't agree with, the, with those folks. Another good resource for you is our Palm Boss Resource Guide. We can mail you a hard copy or you can go to pondboss.com and, and look for the resource guide. That's full, that's full of advertisers in the different uh, arenas, aeration, pond construction, uh, pond management, you know, air, uh, just all the different kinds of vendors that we've got. So that's a good resource for you as well. So let's see here. Yep. Um, Robbie, oh, best way to prevent Robbie. Yep, we talked about that a little bit. Um, Danny Mack says, but now our small pond is so clear. The bass can see everything around the pond, including me. Out, and they're going to watch you too. Uh, let's see, Harrison Davis, not quite. Let's see, dressed like a tree or a bush. <laughs> He's telling Danny Mack how to dress when he goes fishing. That's great. Um... What type of aeration system would you say increases the ponds dissolved oxygen the most? Harrison Davis is asking it. But you know, I'll tell you this. Aeration systems, in my opinion, and you know what? Actually, I can back this up. There's only one kind of aerator that adds dissolved oxygen to the water. And that's a paddle wheel aerator like you see on fish farms in the Mississippi Delta. So, how does that work? That's that's a good timely good question there, Harrison. Uh, bottom diffused aeration, I think, is probably the best one to increase dissolved oxygen, but the aeration doesn't do it. The system doesn't do it. What it does is it creates vertical currents, which pushes water from the bottom of the pond to the top and exposes it to the atmosphere to allow that water to, to get rid of, of its extra gases while it absorbs oxygen and migrates back through the, 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 the whole water column. Now, fountains, they don't draft deep enough, typically, to, uh, to aerate that well. Um, circulators, all they do is really move water horizontally or diagonally. You know, and, and I think all those tools are great tools for the right application, but your question is about increasing DO. I think bottom diffused aeration systems create a current that pushes water from the bottom to the top and circulates it in vertical currents, which allows the atmosphere to increase the dissolved oxygen with the water. And it takes, it, it, it's not something that happens fast because it's uh, where, it's kind of like water being the sponge 
that is soaked with the gases it doesn't need. It's got to expel those as it's absorbing the gases that it needs from the atmosphere. So that's how I like that. So, um, John Brewer, how do flyer sunfish affect bass ponds? They don't affect it at all. As a matter of fact, the only time you really see flyer sunfish, if they're in a pond, like the, the few times I've come across them, I came across one at Richmond, I, I say one, I, I guarantee you there's a, there's a state, a North Carolina state record flyer in Richmond Mill Pond outside of Laurel Hill, North Carolina, near Laurenburg. I have electrofished quite a few of them in there, and there, that water is, so flyers need water that's moving, they like that black water, like an acid. I've seen flyers in oh, probably eight or ten different ponds in my career. And most of them are black water ponds with some water that's moving. That's where they can thrive. So they don't affect that pond at all because they don't get in there and compete with all the other sunfish. They live in a totally different niche in the water. They feed similar to a bluegill, but they don't affect bass ponds at all. There's Billy Granholm checking in. Good to see Billy. All right, let's see here. We'll scroll down and see what we got here. Harrison Davis is enjoying and recommend the Pondology course. Thanks, man. Uh, I'll be after, I've got Chico to do one more video, and when he gets that one finished and I'm comfortable with it, we're going to upload two more videos. And something else, once you buy into the Institute of Higher Pondology course, and if you buy all, if you buy the whole thing, all six different modules, it's four hundred ninety-five dollars. And I guarantee you, if you're getting ready to build a pond or stock a pond, and you want to know more about bass genetics or or how to stock fish, if you buy that, I promise you, you're going to save more than that on the mistakes you don't make. I promise you that. And uh, when what where I was going is every time we add a new video, you don't have to pay for it. You more you pay for it one once once and done. Okay, David Ken, I've been seeing two-inch bluegill dead or dying scattered around the edge. Some marks that indicate they may have bitten by larger fish, but some have no damage at all. Am I correct in thinking they just spawned so early this year that there's not enough food to keep them alive because the water hasn't warmed up enough yet? No, that's not correct thinking. What I'm going to suggest is when you see two-inch bluegill dying, there's something going on with the water. Uh, I'm, I'm writing an article right now about fish afflictions that'll be in the May June issue of Pond Boss, and almost every single affliction with a fish starts with water quality degradation. You know, even fish diseases. Fish are not subject to diseases unless they're stressed, and that stressor typically comes because water quality has deteriorated. So it's making me wonder, David, if you've got something going on with your water quality. Uh, it, it's, there's, there's nothing that's going to go kill a bluegill and not eat it, especially in numbers like that. Uh, the marks that they've been bitten by larger fish, those marks may be, may be bites, but if a bass bites a bluegill, it's going to swallow the bluegill. Another bluegill is not going to bite another bluegill. So when it looks like they've got bite marks on them, it's going to have something to do probably with the second thing that went wrong. The first one is something happened to the water quality to cause it to deteriorate to the point that that size class of that species of fish has become affected and then probably infected. So when they get infected with some bacteria, on the, and the, the most common ones that we see this time of year are Aeromonas and Pseudomonas bacteria. Now, the bad news is that some of those fish are going to die. The good news is they're all not going to die. So what typically happens is, is you get some kind, of a, some kind of a toxin. Most of the time it's natural, even this time of year, that causes a pH spike or causes you know, oxygen deprivation or causes an increase in some kind of a toxin that's natural like Hydrogen sulfide gas around the edge of a pond is organic matter is, is, is composting, you know, and if the fish get in that, then they're going to be, uh, it's going to cause a problem with them and they're going to be stressed. And then when they're weak, you know, the story I told is if, what if my 94 year old dad walked to the mailbox in January and he's a little bit demented and he didn't wear any clothes down there 
And it took him 45 minutes to walk down to the driveway, get the mail naked, comes back. Five or six days later, he's got a cold. A week after that, he's got pneumonia, and then he died. What killed him? The pneumonia? No, the trip to the mailbox. So that's kind of a crappy little analogy. <laughs> but and my dad's been gone a long time. So uh, uh, that's probably a stressor that's water quality related is going to be my guess. Let's see, Jeff Thompson, what size Aquamax for six inch feed train bass? What's the minimum size bass for Aquamax largemouth pellet? Um, feed train bass at six inches long, I'm going to tell you MVP is probably the best for that or 600. Aquamax 600 pellets are about the right size to uh, for a six inch bass to eat. So I would do that. Now, I'd, I'd be tempted to use the MVP because you're going to have other smaller fish coming around that want to eat as well. You know, um, Dave Weber's got a good suggestion, a buffer, strip of, a buffer strip of switchgrass, if you can get something growing in that watershed where we were talking about there. Yep, Harrison Davis, you can't beat a hardy vegetation buffer. Yep, that's the truth. That's the truth. Saw my wife peeking in on me. Okay, uh, Chris Ketchum says it could be ick. Yeah, you know, it could be ick. I didn't even think about that. Ick is, uh, but ick is also, ick, um, I-C-H is spelled, what, what ick is a parasite that forms little white bumps all over the fish. So look at those bluegill up close and see if you can see little white bumps on them. But it's still going to relate back to water quality issues. You know, now where ick typically occurs is when the water temperature rises and falls and rises and falls dramatically. You know, 10 to 15 degrees overnight. It goes up 10 or 15 degrees during the daytime. A storm passes, a front, whatever, it drops 15 degrees. Two or three days later, it goes back up 10 or 15 degrees and it does it again. Those are stressors the cold-blooded fish don't like very much. And it, it hits catfish a lot more commonly than it hits bluegill. Now, the way that it spreads is because you've got a dense number of fish. So if you've got a whole lot of fish, that's going to be a parasite that spreads rapidly among them. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Um, to to look, 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 them, look at them up close. John Dyer, good to see you, buddy. I'm, I'm glad to see Chris. I haven't seen Chris in a long time. Uh, Travis, how's the family, especially the grandkids? Any all the way? No, we don't have any new... New grandkids coming that we know of, but we got 13 on the ground and they keep us hopping. I, I spent, let's see, I, Debbie Debbie spent time with four of them on, let's see, I, um, I guess she was there Friday, Saturday, came home Sunday. I spent time with three of them on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I picked, I gave up three, picked up two, brought them home, and they went home this afternoon. So we have a lot of grandkids and it really kind of it, it, it just, I love them. They're so much fun. They will suck you dry energy wise, <laughs> but I wouldn't trade places with anybody. Yep. And I'll tell Debbie hello. Cause she, she was just peeking in the door a while ago. Cause I promised to take her out when we wrap this up here in just a little bit. So, uh, hit me with some more questions. <clears throat> in the meantime, I'll see if I can talk a little bit more about, Oh, Oh, here's something else about sunfish. Almost all sunfish are carnivores. Not many people know that. You know, a, a bluegill, you, you think that they're om, omnivorous, which if they have to be, they are. But they might try to pull an insect off of a, off of a leaf of a bushy pondweed plant and swallow the pondweed by accident. They don't really graze that on purpose. They would much, much, much rather uh, eat meat. But they're limited by their mouth size. So, like, for example, when you got green sunfish in a pond, they're going to outcompete bluegills. So, let, let's say you got, you got some green sunfish this big, bluegill this big. The green sunfish are going to outcompete those bluegills simply because they have a bigger mouth. They can feed higher up on the food chain. They can eat some of the baby bluegills. So, the bluegills are going to have to grow up and then start reproducing prolifically to overwhelm the green sunfish numbers. And then the green sunfish only have a three to five year lifespan. Bluegill lives six to eight years. So each one of these sunfish has got a little bit different lifestyle, even though some overlap, some compete, you know, but they spawn at different temperatures. Their growth rates are different. Their maximum growth size is different. You know, crappie, 
I think state record in Oklahoma is like four pounds and 12 ounces or something. You know, where largemouth bass there, the record is 13 pounds, even though those are both sunfish. So uh, they are they are limited by the size of their mouth as to how they compete in the food chain. So a warmouth can outcompete a green sunfish, which you can out, outcompete a bluegill, which can outcompete a, a long ear, because a long ear, a little bit more finesse type feeders. They like to live in streams and, and get their food out of cobble, you know? And so all these different sunfish, they live different, different ways. And they don't all, they don't all fit into a pond management plan. You know, it, and what I tell people is, is you pick out the different fish you want to use based on your goals. You know, and bluegill are by far the most available and most widely used sunfish of all, even bass. Okay, um, Justin Ludwig, look at there, Michael Eric, gills love minnows. Yes, they do. Uh, sunfish are limited by the, yep, that's right. All right, so let me see here. Justin Ludwig, good, good, good call there, buddy. Um, Harrison, could you increase your pond's DO by increasing aquatic vegetation or phytoplankton? The answer to that is yes. Now, here's the truth. Get ready for this one. They only produce oxygen during daylight hours or actually sunlight. They have to have sunlight in order to photosynthesize to produce oxygen. So what they're doing is they're taking up carbon dioxide, converting the carbon to energy, regurgitating or, or dispelling or dispensing oxygen, which increases the DO level. Plants can increase DO levels more than any aeration can. But here's the, here's the caveat. When it's a cloudy day or when the sun goes down, the reverse happens. Now they're taking up oxygen, giving off carbon dioxide. So that's respiration. So when that's occurring, they're actually consuming oxygen. So like, it, like right now, the days are getting longer. So we're going to have longer hours of sunlight. So there's going to be a, a typically a net increase in dissolved oxygen coming from photosynthesis. The problem happens is when we get into the hot summer days and the water temperatures are hot and you get a rain shower and three or four cloudy days where photosynthesis doesn't occur, then you can sure see that oxygen spike and go down and can go down really, really fast. Let's see here. Travis, is that a Pond Boss shirt you got on? I see the bass. Actually, no, this is a uh, Bob Lusk Lake Consultant shirt. Debbie watched that video today. She said, you know, you really need to wear more white shirts. <laughs> so I dug one up because I knew she was going to be here tonight. So here we are. Yep. So this is a yeah, Bob Lusk. Everybody that when I have, when I have the uh, Bob Lusk Institute of Fire Pondology on site, which I'm working on that right now, part of your entry fee is you get a shirt. So you advertise me and you like it. <laughs> uh, Billy Bates, I know of at least one place that sells hybrid red air bluegill. Do you know that those hybrids still eat mollusks or do they feed like bluegill? Uh-oh, here. Um, or can they go either way? You know, actually, they, they, they're going to feed more like bluegills. Now, here's one of the things that's really interesting. Uh, I've got a guy that's really, really interested in these things. He bought some of these hybrid red air and bluegill, and they're advertised to not reproduce. However, they reproduce quite a bit. So, and that's a little off your question, but I think it's important to know that. He has found like four different size classes of fish in his pond when he started out stocking that hybrid cross between red ears and bluegills. Now, just because when two sunfishes are crossed, in a lab situation or in a hatchery situation, you know, you think that hybrid doesn't reproduce, but they typically do. The, the hybrid bluegill that most fish hatcheries sell is a cross between female green sunfish and male bluegills. So those offspring, 95% of those are males, and the females are, if I think I'm right on this, I'm pretty sure I'm right, their eggs are not viable. But that male can cross with another species. So I've, I have seen some really funky crosses in a pond after stocking hybrid sunfish three or four or five years down the road. So, um, hi, Christy Berg. Good to see you from Kansas. Let's see. Tommy Welsh, I have 500 pounds of farm-raised channel catfish in my Tugger pond. 
When we first stocked them, we could catch them very easy. Now they won't bite anymore. Maybe catch two or three catfish a week of fishing. Could they be hook shy? Yes, they can. If so, what can I do? I even turned off the feeder for weeks and no bites. Okay, um, Tommy, I don't remember where you are, but I'm going to tell you this. Out of 500 pounds of catfish in a two-acre pond, you're going to catch about half of those fish. So what, what my guess would be is early on when you started catching them, your catch rates were pretty good. Now they've declined. There are going to be a percentage of those fish that are hook shy. They may come to the fish food, but they're going to be hook shy. Now, when you kick that feeder on and you see some pretty aggressive behavior around the feeder, then you can pretty well bet they're still there. Now, one concern I would have in a two-acre pond with 500 pounds of catfish and you fed them is attrition due to predators, specifically river otters. River otters are notoriously expanding their range, and I don't know where you are, but I would sure be thinking about that. Now, kick the feeders on and see if the fish will come to the feeders. And if they do, and you've got a way, if, if, like your supplier that sold you those fish, if they've got a sane, they can, if you feed them up into a, like a shallow cove or a, a corner of a pond or something like that, you can feed them and get them feeding. So, okay, so you're in Kentucky. Okay, so if wherever you, you bought those uh, fish from, you can uh, feed them up. They'll probably, I think they'd be inclined because they want to sell you more fish at some point. They can help you harvest them. So first of all, I would uh, confirm that they're there and do that by feeding. And once you see that they're feeding, you know, they're feeding well, they just won't bite a hook, then you can make some, um, make a bait out of your fish food. You know, you can take some of that fish food, moisten it uh, like a dough, add a little bit of cornstarch to it and make a bait and use it on a treble hook and see if you can catch them like that. But first confirm that they're there. Let's see, I think somebody said get Stubby Steve's pellet. Yep, that's a good idea. Justin's got a good idea. Okay, uh, Travis, you're welcome. <coughs> Danny Mac, daytime photosynthesis produces unusable sucrose sugar. At night, the plant works to turn the sucrose into a thousand usable needs. I wonder if the extended cloudiness forces the plants to continue respiration. It forces them to do respiration because they don't have any choice because they have to have UV rays from the sun to photosynthesize. Okay, it looks like we're getting to that stopping point. So uh, I'm going to go take my bride to the 19th hole here at Pecan Plantation. Palm Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than the date that I'm fixing to have. And this is going to last a few hours. This lasts for a year. Uh, PalmBoss.com, Ask the Boss. There are a lot of free articles. The discussion forum, Ask the Boss. We've got... All, all these videos that we do here, Leanne uploads them at some point to YouTube and links back from our, our Palm Boss website. So that's a good resource for you as well. So uh, I'm going to tell you guys adios and ladies, and I'm tickled to death to be able to hang out with you and uh, on this Wednesday. So I'm not sure where I'll be next Wednesday, but I got a feeling it's going to be with you guys. So until next Wednesday, adios.